Zijn we zover? Laten we die, die, die deur nog even open. Oké. Okay. Ready? Goed. Uh, Welkom. Welkom. Uh, Bombini. <laughs> Welkom uh, hier het uh, NWO, het, de Nederlandse Organisatie voor Wetenschappelijk Onderzoek, de Dutch Research Council. Um, we will do this conference in English, um, so uh, everybody around the world can follow us. We are very happy to have you here. You uh, registered in big amounts for this conference, and that was for NWO uh, a confirmation that this conference was really needed. So we, 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 we really um, are very happy to have you here and invite you all to participate this afternoon. What are we talking about? About expanding scientific research in the Dutch Caribbean. Well, this sounds very nice, and it's also really meant to um, help us all um, create new opportunities in the Dutch Caribbean. Um, my name is Tanja Fry. I'm a director of uh, We Connect, and uh, We Connect is an educational foundation. We are based here in uh, Holland. Uh, we have been active for well, almost six years. One of our advisors is here, Winnie Filippo. My co-founder, Mike Ho, is here. He is also taking pictures. If you don't want to be in the picture, some of you mentioned that, just say no to Mike. My other colleague, Manu, is sitting in, in the back. And in short, uh, we connect is um, building on capacity. It's doing capacity building for these six islands. So we stimulate uh, some of you, uh, young Caribbean professionals. Maybe you want to be researchers in the future. We stimulate this and stimulate you to go back to one of these six islands to help build the labor market, the the societies. Um, Okay, uh, why is NWO or, uh, organizing this um, conference today? Three reasons. Mainly to inform you. First of all, to inform you. Um, the Dutch Research Council has recently changed its granting rules. And as a result, universities in the Caribbean part of the kingdom qualify for NWO research funding. Many details will follow. And feel free to ask questions. The second reason is to update you about the current NWO Caribbean Research Program. I think many of you may already know this research program, and it will continue the coming years. And this implies a structural reinforcement of the knowledge system. And third of all is to network, um, to bring you together. So I will make sure um, we will uh, finish around 4, 4.15, 4 4.30, so we can have drinks and you can meet each other and, and network. Um, the meeting today here in Den Haag uh, is being uh, live streamed, broadcasted. broadcasted. Um, so uh, we can say, uh, bon dia, it's still morning, it's early in the, in the Caribbean. We, we, we can say uh, bon dia to our, uh, to our guests on uh, Aruba, Curaçao, Bonaire, St. Maarten, Seba and Stacia, who are hopefully also uh, watching. Um, and um, I think this is a very good way of sharing knowledge. Um, this is the first meeting of three. The next will be in Curaçao, end of October. And the uh, uh, third conference will be in Aruba. Also, the week of last October, well, end of October, first of, of November. Uh, NWO is hosting these conferences. Uh, we connect, will travel with NWO, which is very nice. Um, and we will we will organize these conferences with the University of Curaçao and with the University of Aruba. So, if you have any uh, contacts in your network, you can uh, um, update them and tell the tell them that. NWO is definitely coming to the islands. Okay, a few practical announcements. Um, yeah, if you could please switch your uh, mobile on silent. There is, of course, Wi-Fi here, and please feel free to share any 
comment, I will put the Wi-Fi for you. Um, yeah, this is the name of the network and this is the Wi-Fi code. So yeah, please feel free to make a post. And NWO is on Facebook, we connect us on Facebook. Um, it's a nice way to share. Um, yeah, so if you uh, could please switch off the sound of your phones and um, yeah, Mike will be taking some pictures, but really in a very modest way. And we will send these pictures to the um, journalists, to the newspapers on the islands, on the six islands. So they will also know that this conference has been here today. Um, okay, the program. I will go back. The program, I think you all have a handout of the program. Just to make sure, I will be really short, so we will have more time for other people. Um, this is me then, um, the revised granting rules, of course, it will be explained to you by different people. We have three very, uh, charming, uh, young female researchers here today. Stacy McDonald from Leiden University. Stacy, welcome. Marielle Ozinga, all the way from Groningen. And hey, where is Lisa? Oh, it's good, sorry. Yes, then we have a break. And then we have Lisa, of course, from Wageningen University. They already have experience with NWO funds. So they will share um, their research knowledge, of course, but also will share their experience uh, with working with the local organi organizations on the islands, for example. Okay, we'll have a break. And then uh, after, after the break, the new development regarding the NWO Caribbean Research Program and we will make sure to have enough time for your questions. Yeah? Okay. Well, I think that's all for me right now. Yeah, the Wi-Fi code and I am going to... Yes, everybody has it. And I will make sure... Yeah, to introduce the first speaker the the openings speech really um, that is given by Wim van den Doel, Professor Wim van den Doel, a member of the executive board of NWO and member of the NWO program committee committee for Caribbean research. Um, he will have to leave sh uh, shortly afterwards because he has a flight to Jakarta this evening. So uh, we're really happy to uh, have you here. Um, Meneer van den Doel, after you. Um, you can just gewoon doorklikken hier. Ja, oké. Ja. Oh yeah, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, my name is Wim van den Doel. I'm member of the executive board of NWO. I hope everybody hears yeah. me. <laughs> or this is perhaps better. Yes. Okay. Good. Great. Well. It's great to have you all here. It's, uh, it's great to see you in uh, such uh, numbers over here. And we, of course, we have an indefinite number uh, through the uh, live stream uh, uh, present. Um, because, well, it's very good that, we, that, that, that you are present here because this is an important meeting. I think it's, you can even say it's an historic meeting because we really go to the next st level of uh, uh, research collaboration and research funding uh, in the Dutch Caribbean. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and to, to say something about uh, what you will hear in much more detail uh, during, uh, during the day. Um, of course, we have a history. Uh, in 2012, already was decided that there uh, um, uh, was funding for Caribbean research or um, uh, research which strengthens uh, also the uh, research collaboration between the Caribbean and, and the Netherlands, but also focuses on, on topics uh, which rela are, are related to the, uh, the Caribbean. It was funded uh, by the Ministry of, uh, of Education and, uh, and Science and Culture. Um, there were two open uh, calls in 2014 and 2016, and I think we see uh, three uh, recipients of uh, of the uh, the calls uh, here present so you will hear more about what's going on in these two uh, two calls but we then thought in at nwo uh, to cut with others that well this was is also very, very nice the two calls but can we do more can we go the extra step so 
well, let's say this is phase two. Somebody called it phase one and phase two, but it's we are going really into a new direction. Two things, uh, which will be explained uh, in much more detail during the day. We took some generic measures, and uh, we took some specific uh, measures. Okay, the generic measures. It's very, in the end, it's all very simple, um, because in uh, the NWO's regulations, and in our um, subsidy reglement, so the, the the governing text with regard to our our funding, it said. Who are eligible? Nederlandse universiteiten. Well, if you change that into universiteiten gevestigd in het Koninkrijk der Nederlanden, suddenly, so a few words, but suddenly everything changes, at least, at least with regard to Caribbean uh, uh, research, because now people uh, em employed by the universities uh, in the Dutch Caribbean are also able to um, uh, submit their proposals to NWO. And this is also a very important word, all. All funding lines, because today you will focus on the Caribbean program, so the 2 million euros, uh, which is available especially for Caribbean uh, 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 projects. But just a few the change of the few words, so Nederlandse Universiteiten, to univers universities in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. This implies that everyone uh, employed by the Caribbean universities can access funding in all our instruments. And all our instruments, that's not 2 million euros, that's in total, let's say, 900 uh, million euros. So that's an enormous opportunity. So the talent program, the Veni Vidi Vici program, is now open. Uh, for any, everyone uh, in the Caribbean. We also have the open competition. Each of our domains have an open competition. So you can simply submit your proposal and get one PhD out of the, out of the proposal or a team, depending on what you want. But all our instruments are open. Also the national research agenda, you heard, you heard about it perhaps, is also open to uh, uh, sub submissions uh, from the Caribbean. So this is the generic uh, measure we took. That's why I called this meeting a historic meeting, because this is a very, just a few words, but it's, it's I think, very uh, important and very, very historic, I think. Okay, the specific uh, measures, um, which will be explained in much more detail than I, I will do, because we will, because since there is this open competition uh, available to anyone, we will not uh, uh, um, uh, do an open call like the, the other two calls, uh, which were just, in a way, well, they had to be Caribbean, they had to be interdisciplinary, but in, they, they were open with regard to the topic. And everyone can now go to the open competition and, and, and get funding for such a project. So what to do with the two million euros? Well, actually, we said, let's focus, let's give it a, uh, give it a more focus than than in the other two uh, programs. So we hope that we can uh, establish two research groups, teams, um, who will get, over a period of, uh, of five years, a considerable amount of money, because that's five million years in total. Of course, it's one million a year, but that's five million if you think about it in total. That's bigger than our Vici. Uh, grant, for instance, so it's a super Vici grant, perhaps you can call it that way. So this is all, again, this is a historic moment. We hope to have two, two, two major teams, so with two principal investigators, and of course they will be selected through an NWO call. You will hear about it uh, uh, more about it um, um, uh, today. Um, it says in the range, the range of Vici, but it's actually more. Huh? It's, if you think about it, it's even bigger than a Vici grant. So it's, it's, uh, we hope it is, it's, uh, it's, it, it will inspire people to, uh, to, uh, to submit. We hope. Um, those teams will be working on the Caribbean, and so we hope also through that the people are there. It also uh, strengthens uh, uh, the, the, the regional capacity. 
Okay. Call expected for the autumn of 2019. Um, where, when does the autumn start? Uh, 21st of uh, September. So from the 21st of September onwards, I think in an earlier slide it said September. Uh, but I think st September is still in the autumn, huh? yeah. So, so we we hope to have it have it in September uh, 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 open uh, 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 for 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 everyone who wants to wants to submit. I look to our NWO uh, people who have to do this. So uh, we make a definition. September is also still in the autumn. Yes. So after the summer, uh, you you will be you will be able to submit your proposals for these two uh, two teams. Um, we hope that this really ma makes a change uh, on the Caribbean, on the Dutch Caribbean, that there will be two major groups there, teams working on, on issues which are relevant, uh, relevant for the Caribbean. So it, it should be in the framework of small island development uh, states uh, agenda. So it's, it's, it, it is focused, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, it, it should be relevant uh, for the societies uh, on, the, on, on the islands. Um, um, so that's one part of my story. Two teams over there uh, working for relevant uh, uh, research. But the other one, of course, is a change of these few words in the, our regulations, which opens up uh, all kinds of other possibilities uh, uh, with regard to Caribbean research, but also for researchers from the Caribbean. And I think that's, that, that, that there are two historic steps. Of course, we have to see what it, how it will, what, what, what type of results will uh, follow, but I think the first step is done. You will hear much more about it uh, today. You can ask everything you want to know about these uh, two, two measures uh, today. I wish you a very productive uh, uh, meeting. Uh, I'm sure it will be a productive meeting. Um, you are in great hands, so, so it will be a, a great day. Thank you very much. Meneer Van der Doel, I saw many people uh, making notes. Is it possible to share your... Yeah? Of course. Yes. But, but we have colleagues here yeah. who, who will... Who will yeah, we will share. Who will share everything, but who will explain in much more detail what I uh, yeah. just announced. So you will have all the opportunities to ask uh, questions. Yeah. How do you do, how do the live stream people... Can, can, they, can they ask questions? How, how, uh, how does that no, work? No. Non oh, no, non-interactive. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but, that, but but we, we go to Aruba and Curaçao. So yes. That, and then yes. and then it will be interactive. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Just just out of cur yes, curiosity, you're, you're flying to to Jakarta tonight. Yes. Uh, East exciting. East Indies. East yes. Indies um, we um, uh, have a uh, joint uh, research program with Indonesia as NWO. We are starting it um, uh, today, and uh, we will try to expand. Our research collaboration with uh, Indonesia the next uh, the next week. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And have a good flight. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Meneer van den Doel, um, I think we're going to the clip, right? To to the film clip. Um, the film clip. We have a video message. It's a bit interactive then by uh, Professor Glenn Today. Uh, Glenn Today, I think, very well known as director magnificus of the University of Aruba, but also member of the NWO. Program Committee for Caribbean Research. So let's see the Caribbean perspective from uh, Mr. Glenn today. Moet ik iets doen? Wat? Ik moet hier iets doen. Oké. Ja? Wat moet dan? De muis. Oh, oké. En dan? Oh, hier. Ja. Okay. Hello, my name is Glenn Today and I am director of the University of Aruba. The Kingdom of the Netherlands consists uh, out of four countries. It is the Netherlands, Aruba, Curaçao and St. Martin. And Aruba, Curaçao and St. Martin as countries reside in the Caribbean region. But what a lot of people don't usually think about is that the Netherlands also has a Caribbean presence because there are three particular entities of the Netherlands, Bonaire, Sintestatius, and Seba, which also are situated in the Caribbean. So the Caribbean part of the kingdom has four countries. It is very important to do 
scientific research in these regions so that scientists understand better what is happening in the region, but also organizations such as the government, but also private organizations can make better informed decisions. And that's why it's very important that we do research. Up to this moment, there were not many opportunities to do research in this region because of the lack of finances, funds. That is why it's so important that the NWO has opened the opportunity for these, uh, these areas and also the institutions within these areas to apply for funding for scientific research. Up to this moment, we've had the experience as uh, University of Aruba, but also I think my partners within the Caribbean area, that these funds were not open and available to us because the NWO funds were restricted to the European part of the kingdom. Up, when, up to now then, it was impossible for us to initiate scientific research and apply for these funds. A few years ago, the NWO made it possible for us to participate with partners uh, to have access to these funds and to design scientific research. Our experiences with this have been up to now that when we cannot apply ourselves, the institutes of the European part of the kingdom are in the driver's seats with the most current changes that are now upcoming that we can apply ourselves, I believe that it is an important opportunity for the people and the institutions of this region, the Caribbean region of the Kingdom, to take initiative. Hello, my name is Glenn Today and I am the rector of the University of Aruba. The Kingdom of the Netherlands consists uh, out of four countries it is the Netherlands, are in the driver's seats. Slight technical problem, sorry. Yeah, that's a good idea, Niels. Thank you. Being in the driver's seat is an important remark of Glenn today. We will uh, show you his, uh, his finishing lines later on. Niels uh, is Niels van den Berg. He's one of the program managers of NWO concerning the Caribbean program. And he will explain more about the granting rules. Niels van den Berg. Thank you, Tanya. Um, let's see if my presentation will yeah. pop up. Um, Yes, so we already heard a lot about this change in the granting rules. So smart, small change, large implications. And these implications, actually, what do they mean in practice? These are questions that are mostly relevant for the people employed at the universities in the Caribbean. So most Dutch researchers already are familiar with this. Um, so we will have these meetings also in the Caribbean in which we can really interact on all the details. But we have a very diverse audience now and maybe also through a live stream and not everybody is familiar with NWO so I will briefly introduce NWO and how our granting system works and this could also be relevant for the researchers actually at the Dutch universities because this change in the granting rules may also provide new opportunities to collaborate with the universities in the Dutch Caribbean so it's also relevant for these researchers um, yeah so the small change um, so what's NWO for people who are not that familiar with NWO? 
Um, so we do funding. Uh, funding is in programs. We have calls for proposals where people submit proposals. We also have our own research institute, so that's the, the funding. We're involved in programming, so in, uh, in national, international research strategy. Uh, the influencing, we support researchers, and we try to connect researchers amongst each other and with societal partners. Um, the mission of NWO is to advance world-class scientific research that has scientific and societal impact. So NWO is an independent directive body, and, and, and we are following the responsibility of the university of, of the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Science. And as Wim already mentioned, we have a large budget. Most of it comes from this ministry, but there's also other um, sources of funding from other ministries of other organizations. Um, so the principle is that most universities in the Netherlands, they receive the largest part of their funding directly from the ministry. And what NWO does is the second flow of money, the additional funding to the universities. And we do this always in national competition. So based on the quality uh, and uh, through independent evaluation procedures. So this gives us the opportunity to select talent, um, to select the best quality research, and also to have some strategic um, um, ways to program. Um, so this is good to realize that it's always in competition. So NDRBO is set up in different components. Uh, here I just uh, present the most relevant ones. So we have three domains, the science domain, uh, the domain social sciences and humanities, uh, applied sciences and engineering, and we have health research at SONMW. Uh, then we have VOTRO, which focuses on science for global development. Um, we have NRO, which is embedded in uh, social sciences domain. Uh, and we have SIA, who funds research at the universities of applied sciences. So all these um, components of NWO have their own programs. Some of them uh, cut through all the domains, but there's a big amount of programs and funding. And we can um, summarize them in six um, main lines. So the first one is a talent program. So this is curative, curiosity driven. This is the Vichy, for example, that was already mentioned. Um, then we have our open competition in most of our domains. Um, then we have programs um, that are uh, more strategically thematic, for example, the Dutch National Research Agenda and the programs that uh, contribute to the top sectors. Um, then we have specific programs that are set up in partnerships with external partners. And we have programs that are really um, have a, a, a long-term um, focus, but are really focused on a specific theme like the Caribbean Research Program, but also the, the, the Netherlands Polar Program. And last, we have infrastructure programs. Um, so, as has been mentioned a lot, now the researchers at the Caribbean, um, Dutch Caribbean universities, they can apply. So if they have a good research idea, the right network, uh, there's a program that really suits their research idea, they could submit a proposal which will be evaluated in competition and there will be a funding decision. Um, but it actually doesn't mean that everybody can just submit a proposal. There are a little more conditions and I would like to uh, present them here. So to be an applicant, uh, you need to have a PhD or a professional position that's also included in our regulations and you need to have a paid position, so not um, a zero hours contract, as we mentioned, uh, sometimes call it. Uh, so permanent employment or a tenure track position. Um, so if you have a small project or maybe a, a personal grant like the Vici, you apply for it yourself. You are the applicant, you're the main applicant. But if you have bigger projects, you will probably submit them in collaboration with other researchers. So multidisciplinary, maybe between different institutes. And then you could also simply be a co-applicant. Um, so this is also possible. And then you submit a proposal together and the co-applicant receives some of the funding within the project for a PhD or, or, or to, to, to execute a part of the project. Um, in general, we fund staff, which PhD postdoc positions, uh, material costs, uh, knowledge exchange, 
but one thing is really important to uh, note is that in general, we don't fund the salaries of existing staff or your own salary. Of course, there are some exclu exclusions when you have a personal grant, you know, it's like the, the Vici, or there's an option sometimes to get the, uh, how do you call it, replacement funding. So this is an option sometimes included in calls, so you can be um, um, get funds so you don't have to do your educational tasks and you can focus a little bit more on research. Um, and, well, the last thing which is really important to realize is that there's competition and the success rates really, uh, rates really vary. So there are funding programs at NWO that are really competitive uh, and the success rate is low, like around 10%. We aim for 25%. And some programs that are really specific or, or require a lot of co-funding demands, then sometimes success rates are even higher and they go up to 30% or even more. So these are things to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, so I would like to uh, end with some, some concluding thoughts. So I, I really think that, that this gives a chance for the, for the universities in the Dutch Caribbean to strengthen their research activities. So when, you, when they already have strong research lines, it really gives them the opportunity, like uh, Glenn said, to be in a driving seat. Maybe if your research line is not as strong, you could collaborate with others and as a co-applicant do receive funding and really start to, to develop this research line further. Um, so chances for new and more substantial collaborations. So not only collaboration, with your own time, but really so you can receive uh, some funding. Um, hopefully it will provide opportunities for talent uh, to inspire and train students. Uh, and it will, as Glenn also mentioned, uh, you can address societal challenges and strengthen the environment for innovation. Um, but it's also important to have realistic expectations. And um, so it's good to realize that the system is competitive and in the Netherlands, we've seen a trend of professionalization. So universities uh, have gone through a process of, of, of developing research strategies, planning this and supporting their researchers by granting support offices. Uh, researchers uh, improve their skills in grant writing. They participate in selecting committees so they can see how committees select research proposals. So you learn from that. Um, you need a strong track record, good collaborations, and uh, last but not least, you need an innovative research idea. Because usually just incremental research will not be very successful in our, in our, in our program. So it depends on the, on the focus of the program, of course, but that's a, a general uh, thing to mention. Um, so, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say, but I, I think this really... Um, um, this small change will, will really provide a great opportunity and I really hope that it will give you new chances to pursue your, your research idea and to set up uh, new collaborations. Uh, we will see a couple of nice examples later on, uh, but first uh, we will give you the opportunity to ask some questions if, if they are there. And my colleagues Arnold and Josef will assist me with answering them. Who has a question? It's a lot of information to digest. Yes. Meneer David Finkers. Yes, is, is there also an opportunity for uh, knowledge institutions uh, on the Caribbean to uh, participate, uh, not just universities? Um, I think that's the, the same for the institutions in the Netherlands that are normally not on the default list at NWO is that you can participate, but then you cannot receive funding for your own activities. Um, however, for example, there are some NWO programs like the National Science Agenda, which is much wider in the scope of, of, of uh, letting research organizations uh, um, participate. So maybe this could also be an opportunity. Uh, I must mention that the science agenda is very competitive. Uh, there are a lot of proposals being submitted. Mm -hmm. Joseph Stuffer, yes? If I uh, may add something to that. Uh, like in the Netherlands, we also uh, have in the, in the Caribbean part of the kingdom uh, the possibility that the uh, knowledge uh, institutions other than universities, they have uh, part-time um, professors 
or part-time um, uh, scientists working at university. By this, they also have the right, those persons have the right to, to apply for funding with uh, NWO. And that's what we see quite a lot in, in the Netherlands as well. And that is an opportunity for the, for the Caribbean, uh, for the islands, to build a strong network. So it will take some time to set this up, but there are quite, a, quite good uh, opportunities there. Yes. Wouter, Wouter Veenendaal. Thank you. I have two questions. One is out of curiosity because you said the deadline for applications is probably going to be September and you'll be visiting the islands in October. So I was wondering about the, the sequence of that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds not really logical to me. And the second question is you mentioned that uh, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, researchers have a lot of uh, ex uh, experience with applying for funding, being part of MVO committees. So how does this work in practice if people from Caribbean universities who don't have that much experience with that will apply for funding? I mean, to what extent is there a level playing field really between applicants? Your first question um, is that um, uh, Wim was speaking about publishing the call for proposals. So this doesn't mean that it will be the deadline. Maybe it's still a bit ambitious in September, but at least that's the aim. And then there will be a large period for people to uh, uh, start developing their ideas, set up collaborations before they will submit it. And especially because these grants are very complex and not something new, we really need to give people time to prepare. And Jozef will tell more about this second phase later on in the program. And I think Arnold has a reply to your last question. Mm -hmm. Arnold's, Arnold Lubbers, yes. NWO. Hi, thank you all for being here. Thank you for the question as well. Um, when it comes to experience in committees, it's a simple task for NWO to invite people on committees. So uh, at least it's one of my tasks next year to compile the Veni Committee for the Social Sciences and Humanities domain. So I will actively try to see if I can get researchers on board from the University of Aruba and Curaçao. It's as easy as that. Uh, when it comes to the track record of potential applicants, um, NWO is working towards forming a more inclusive type of procedure. We are expanding or restricting our forms in order to um, make it so that different career paths can be assessed in a more equal way. So we're working on that. Okay. Yes? Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, I had a question. So if I understood correctly, um, the Proposals will be in groups or are you also allowed to send one individual proposal? And my second question is, you have to have a PhD in order to send a proposal, right? Um, are you asking about the, the general uh, funding through all instruments or the, the specific, the new phase of the Caribbean uh, New phase program? of the Cari Caribbean. Do I um, then have to, let's say, uh, collaborate, form a group in order to be able to apply for a proposal in the Caribbean? Or are there also going to be calls for individual projects related to the Caribbean? As, uh, as Wem van den Doel said, there will be no open call uh, for uh, standalone individual projects. But there will be a call for for a ma for setting up a major group or scientific program. But uh, as Wim also said, uh, we consider this uh, we consider um, uh, allowing um, uh, Caribbean universities to uh, to submit um, uh, their proposals. So that is actually the 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 way. To um, to give the opportunity to uh, to submit uh, uh, individual proposals, so that is uh, the generic measure and a specific measure. We mentioned is more uh, directed uh, towards uh, bigger initiatives. I will tell a little bit about that uh, later on. Yeah. If if I may ask, so please save all your questions for uh, the continuation of the the Caribbean Research Program for later on, because in that. Later on the program, Joseph will tell more about that, and then we can ask questions about that. Let's now focus on the generic measures. Yeah. Well, for, for some people, like your master or bachelor student, right? No, master. master student, yeah. So this is maybe a bit new and a bit, uh, yes. Um, other questions, please? Yes. Charnice Trinidad, she's from the cabinet of Curacao. Yes. Uh, thank you, Tania. 
Um, is there a maximum amount for an application? And is a uh, personal contribution, dus een eigen bijdrage, is it necessary? Uh, the amount you can request for a project really depends on the, on the instrument, on the program. So there could be small ones in which you request budget for one PhD. Uh, there could be really big ones in collaboration which could be up to a million or more than a million euros in which you have multiple PhDs and postdocs and, and more and material investment. So it really depends on the, on, on the program, on the, on the instrument. And the own contribution, um, it's always possible for a university to, if, if you reach the limits of what you can ask f in a project, then maybe if you need more to complete that research, you can just add that yourself, or you can find a partner. The, some of our programs actually require you to have a partner from a private or a public organization that in-kind co-funding or with uh, in-cash co-funding. So it really depends on the, on, on the program. But it's not, most of the times it's not necessary, not required. But you always do an investment. You have to write a proposal. proposal. If you get a PhD, a project, you will invest your own time in it. So the university always puts in an own contribution by providing supervision and, I don't know, there's lab facilities, there's, there's a lot of things that you always add to the project. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes? Yeah, thank you. The universities in the Caribbean often have a lack of facilities. You mentioned lab facilities. Is it also possible to qualify for money to build facilities, so there is an infrastructure program line within uh, NWO, but is it possible to get money for that? Yes, I think so, because uh, all the funding instruments of uh, NWO are open for all universities within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So nothing, uh, no funding line is excluded from this general rule. So it is also possible to uh, apply for infrastructure, scientific infrastructure. And of course, uh, different uh, rules and, and uh, will apply to that, but that is uh, just uh, the same as for other programs. But yes. Yes. And, and to add is, uh, in, on a project base, you can always ask for some material costs for, for small equipment. So that might not be enough to really set up a whole lab, but it always provides some opportunities to start building up some, some, some infrastructure capacity. Tatjana Becker from Aruba. Um, do co-applicants, um, are they able to be part of different proposals? If they are asked in different proposals? Yeah, so if I understand correct, you, your question is if applicants can be uh, involved in different uh, proposals. Um, yes, usually on a, in one instrument, in one program, there's a limitation. Like you can be one main applicant and you can, in addition, be a co-applicant. Uh, but... If there's another program and your research also fits in that program and they're more or less at the same time, usually there's no restriction of submitting another idea to the other program, right? So, and within the same funding round, so if you would have our open competition, you're not allowed to have two proposals at the same time, but as soon as one proposal has been processed, granted or rejected, then you could probably start a new one. So that's more or less the idea. So you have the level of one program, yes, there's usually limitation, and then you have the broad scope of different programs and you can be involved in different programs. Yes? Any more questions? No, at this moment? Okay. Um, shall we start to um, try and see if we can... You, you wanted to watch Glenn today to start... Okay, bon. yes. Okay, um, these gentlemen will be back at, at the end of the conference. So you, <laughs> they, they, they will definitely not disappear. Um, and uh, let's continue then with some praktijkvoorbeelden. Um, Stacy is Stacy McDonald. She's a PhD student from uh, Leiden University. Um, she's born on Curaçao, not even 30 years ago, she's really young, to Suriname parents. And she grew up in Curaçao, 
came to study in the Netherlands, like so many of the Caribbean students who come here. And she studied child and family studies at Leiden University. And she now works on her PhD at the Royal Institute of Dutch, Caribbean and Asian Studies, also known as KITLV. Um, and she works at KITLV as part of the NWO funded research project Confronting Caribbean Challenges. It's very, Stacey is very interesting. She will explain uh, about her research later also because she combines her PhD with her own consultancy company, Mac and Field. And she will tell you uh, more about this, but especially this combination of social studies and nature studies, which she specializes in, and her research and field skills uh, makes her uh, approach really interesting. So I will. Please invite uh, Stacey McDonald for the coming uh, 10 to 15 minutes. I will give you a PowerPoint button. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for that really nice introduction, Tanya. I think I can skip a lot of my uh, first minute of presentation now. Um, so I was asked by the NWO to um, share something about my experiences with doing research in the Dutch Caribbean. And as Tanya said, I am a PhD student at the Royal Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies, also known as KITLV. Um, and I started my PhD about... Uh, little over four years ago now. <laughs> um, and the topic of my presentation is called Last Talk, More Action, Multiple Hats, which is kind of becoming my philosophy, I think, in life um, <laughs> by now. Um, yeah. So um, as Tanya said, I have Dutch Caribbean roots and I have a background in um, social and environmental psychology. Um, I did indeed do child and family studies first, but then for my master I decided to take on a different route. And that was also because of my curiosity in you know, what motivates people to protect the environment. And um, I have a very big love for nature as well, so that was kind of what was driving my, uh, my interest. And um, for my PhD research I focus on nature conservation on the Caribbean Netherlands, so Bonaire, Seba and Sint Eustatius. Um, and what drove my initial question was the kind of um, uh, controversial or, um, well, debated uh, notion that kind of lives sometimes on the islands is that only Dutch foreigners are concerned with what happens in the natural environment, which is of course not true, but that is kind of an idea that lives there. So based on that curiosity, I wanted to know, you know, who are these people who are concerned with the natural environment and uh, what motivates them, but also spe specifically what um, do they run up against within the new constitutional reforms the islands were experiencing since 2010. So that's just really briefly general gist of, of my research. And to answer my questions, I used multiple disciplines, but also multiple methods. Um, I used insights and theories from anthropology, psychology, by now also I think sociology, political sciences, I don't know, I think I'm doing a bit of everything, ecology maybe even. Um, and I used multiple methods, so I did a series of interviews, um, I launched an online survey, um, I conducted several months of field work on all three islands, and lastly I also did action research, so participatory action research on um, Bonaire. Um, now, to share a bit about my experiences. So what I noticed is that I had quite easy access when it came to you know, finding who the nature activists, um, so to say, are. Um, they were not very difficult to locate. Um, and they were also f quite willing to talk to me. And I think that has to do with different reasons. Um, part because of my own Caribbean background, I think that really helped to, to gain access to the community, um, but also because I have a different approach. So that's what I'm going into a bit uh, more now. So the first thing I noticed is that 
within nature-oriented research on the Caribbean, I was on the one hand one of many, but also one of few. Um, so on the one hand, there's like a big stream of um, ecologists, biologists, marine scientists, you know, a lot of um, more of the hard scientists, so to say, who are doing a lot of research on the Caribbean because of its pristine environment, you know, curious to see what, what, what's happening and what is the state of it and, and what do we need to do with it. Um, so I was one of, you know, that really big list of nature uh, researchers. But on the on other hand, I was also one of few because I think I was maybe the only one, I'm not sure, not really, probably, but one of few who looked at this question with, or this area with um, a more social or psychological um, uh, brill, glasses, view, perspective, whatever. Um, so, that was something that came to my attention and I also noticed that that was quite appreciated because a lot of people know that you know you have all these researchers who are then diving and doing experiments and yeah not everybody on the island really knew what to do with that information at the time but all of a sudden there was this girl asking them questions about so why do you do this or why do you clean up your I don't know the the dumps on the on the beaches and and I think that was kind of uh, fun for them to talk about and to share their um, motivation but also I think a lot of frustrations you know when dealing with these environmental issues um, so another thing I learned was that not all conventional research methods really work on the islands. And um, I say that also being a bit critical about myself, that I may have been a bit naive at times when doing research uh, in the Caribbean. Because, for example, I did um, an online survey and that just didn't really deliver a lot of data. I think my survey was too long. My expectations of people being willing to sit behind a computer for half an hour answering boring questions, well, that's not really within the, within the research culture, culture on the islands, um, which is maybe more the case here, as people are maybe more inclined to protect their anonymity here and... You know, it's, it's a bit more common in the Netherlands, at least, to uh, fill out online surveys and not so much maybe on the islands. But other methods did work very well. For example, um, interviews, but also the action research that I did. You know, doing something um, hands-on, something tangible, um, with, you know, felt results. And um, people were very willing to collaborate with me and share, um, share their experiences and their knowledge with me in that, through that form. So then a third thing, um, I also noticed a bit of a mismatch between island concerns um, and the interests of the government or scientific institutes. And I think that was also addressed a bit by um, Wim and, and, and Niels as well, saying, well, there's a need for, you know, different type of research. The, the questions that we pose coming from the Netherlands aren't always the things that people on the island are concerned with or even interested in or maybe they already have the answers to those questions because they've been, been faced with that problem for decades and they already know what needs to be done. Um, so um, that was sometimes, especially in the field of nature I feel, it can be a bit difficult because when you're dealing with societies that maybe experience more poverty and then all of a sudden you're like, no, but we need to save this Iguana, I'm looking at my colleague because that's what he does. Um, <laughs> but um, they're like, yeah, but I, come on, I just need food on the table. Why can't I eat this? Or, you know, what are you dealing with? Or are you, what are you going at? Um, so that can be quite challenging, but not uh, less important. Um, and then finally, um, especially again in the, well, not I think it's not unique for the, the nature research atmosphere, but in general, there are not a lot of people who are, you know, really... Uh, considered to be the experts or, you know, the, the biggest activists when it comes to certain topics. So um, what you notice is that uh, when you are in a specific field, everybody of all the researchers are talking with the same people. You know, if you look at the interview list at the end of a research report, it's always the same list of people on all the islands. And you can imagine that can result to a bit of research fatigue among those um, dear people who willingly share their free time and all their knowledge and then see what is even, I think, more important, um, all this information, and then it ends up in a report and nobody does anything with it. And then, you know, the next research, researcher comes and asks the same questions and ugh, they're like, okay, never mind. Um, so, um, not only are there few who are sharing all their information, but also few people who are trying to do everything. So, there's this big need on the islands, I feel, that there is... Um, you know, it's time for less talk and more action. And then the question rises, but how and who is going to do this? Because we're only with, you know, a handful of people willing and able and, and capable of, of doing this type of work, maybe. 
Um, so, expanding research in the, in the Caribbean. So I kind of drew the conclusion that now with the NWO calls, you know, the, the first call, the second call, we know more and more what needs to be done, but then the question remains who is going to do it. And um, I think I've said this to my, my supervisors from almost day one, like, oh, I don't know if I'm really like a big uh, scientist and if that's really the career path that I want to follow. I'm more, you know, I like to do more applied things. I get more um, satisfaction from it. So uh, we'll see. And then in my third year, I got a really cool opportunity to collaborate with the Worldwide Fund of the Netherlands, who is now also more active on the three islands. Um, and the Worldwide Fund of the Netherlands was you know, very much aware of um, fisheries management issues. And then they were like, well, it's also very much a social issue, so maybe we can know, we can ask someone to, to help us with this. So they approached me through the Kaitel Fay, and then based on the needs of, of the island, I focused my research on Bonaire. I helped establish a fisheries cooperative, which is now working directly with the local institutes to hopefully improve fisheries management um, efforts there. So that was when I got my first taste on how you can combine scientific research, because this was like bulk of rich data that I can now write several chapters on um, for my dissertation, um, but also kind of contributes directly to the, to the island communities. So building on that, oh yeah, and then I have the question about who's going to fund this, but I think that is changing now with NVO, so that's really great. <laughs> um, so kind of building on that, um, and, and again, having this, this kind of uh, itch that I don't really want to do a lot with, you know, only science, but also more applied stuff. As Tanya, men Tanya mentioned, I um, started up my uh, company together with Tim van Wagensveld, who's sitting over there. He's a biologist, and we were on Stasia, and then we were walking, and we were like, ah, there is so much we can do here, but there are so few people that can actually do it. Maybe if we join forces, we can help, you know, do, conduct some projects. And then we got a really cool opportunity um, last year to um, uh, manage a project called Reforestasia which is focusing on uh, reforesting the island. And um, that was granted based on the damage that was caused by the hurricanes uh, in 2017. Um, so we collaborated with Stenapa, because Stenapa approached us also knowing, well, uh, it's really difficult. We don't have all this expertise or knowledge in-house to, to execute such a big project. So they approached us with a question, can you maybe help? And then um, we have now a three-party, you could say, uh, collaboration also with the local governmental department, LVV, uh, Landbouw, Veetild, and Visserij. And um, yeah, so that's, that's really uh, a cool project, really applied, really based on the needs of the islands. But at the same time, now we're thinking about ways on how we can maybe connect this project or give back to the scientific community. Because doing this work and, and working on um, well, within this field as well, it, it will undoubtedly um, result in a lot of data and a lot of knowledge. And there's a lot of room to do experiments on what is the best way to grow a forest or you know, which plants types would best work. Um, so we're now thinking of ways, can we link these types of projects back to the scientific community as well? Um, then, finally, to kind of summarize are my experiences really that typical for Caribbean research? I would say yes, but also no. Um, because I feel like a lot of the things that I noticed are also very applicable in the Dutch scientific community and maybe more specific for the Dutch Caribbean scientific community, but I think you see a lot of, um, same, a lot of the same patterns uh, reoccurring here. So on the one hand, as I mentioned, we're dealing with a small, small communities and everybody knows everybody, but as I noticed here as well, all of a sudden, you know, like all the scientists, especially in a specific field, like these are the people you're working with. And, and I think for the islands, you know, you have three universities. If you need to collaborate with those universities, there aren't a lot of people there. So you get to know everybody quite quickly. So the, the bridge between the Netherlands and, and the Caribbean and, and working together often quickly results into everybody knowing everyone. Um, and then there's also this idea of everybody's wearing multiple hats. So that's something that I experienced in my own work, especially if you go back to the islands, which is highly appreciated as well, just not to go there and then leave and, and never come back. Or, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, 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 a pet peeve, I think that's what it's called. <laughs> um, 
But as, as soon as you start really implementing your work as well or engaging in multiple projects, you notice that all of a sudden you're, you're a consultant, you're a researcher, you're an advisor, you're, an, you're a volunteer, you know, you're involved with all these different organizations, all these different groups, but also different teams, which is again, not typical for the islands itself, the people who live there, but also if you're doing work on the islands. And then finally, that your background approach and also your network matter. So as I mentioned, my own Caribbean background really helped me to gain access to the community, but I think there's also a lot to say for the approach you have. So if you're just going there, diving, looking at corals and then leaving again, I mean, nobody's gonna know you and, and know what you're doing. Um, but if you're trying to involve the community, maybe educate people there as well about why it's relevant, why it's important, what they can do, um, have that bit of a more social approach, especially I think in more hard science or environmental sciences, um, that just leaves a bigger impact and it's just better appreciated. And then lastly, your network ma matters. So only not on the islands. If you know everybody, it's, it's great because then you have really cool access and you get a lot of information, but also here, I mean, knowing the people, the universities here who are involved and the, network, the networks here, the, the organizations here, um, knowing how NVO works, you know, how to get funding, um, and I think for me, again, personally, um, being from the islands, doing this work, it also built my own uh, name, so to say, a bit within the research, but also governmental community here. By now, people know, kind of, or some people know the work that I'm doing. And I also noticed that more often I'm getting, you know, becoming actively pro saying, hey, we know you did this work. Could you maybe also think along with this? So it, um, it's applicable, applicable on both sides. Now, very quick, um, I think my takeaway message or question or things to talk about really tie into what has been discussed earlier today um, with the opening of the grants as well. So we've been talking about research valorization for a while um, and this has been repeated with the second NVO call as well and I think there has been already several changes that have been taking place, even more so now. Um, but I feel it's also time for maybe, you know, thinking about new age valorization, um, if, that, if that's a thing. Um, so we've been, you know, presenting our work or organizing a symposium or, you know, kind of to, to give that knowledge back. And sometimes that's all we can do. So it's not to criticize fundamental research or if that's all you can do in that moment. But I think for other projects, there's way more opportunity to really invest back into the islands or to build on local capacity. And I think that will also help um, create more continuity, which is also one of NVO's um, goals in terms of implementation. So can we continue to invest in and contribute to island capacity? Um, can we keep building local networks and infrastructure? So I think this new opportunity is really great. Um, maybe there are still some you know, tweaks and things we need to think about with the actual implementation, but it open up, opens up a lot of um, opportunities. So with that, I will leave it today. Wow, well, we had this experience with Stacy when we made a film clip. She, she starts and woo, very, very interesting, very interesting, very upbeat and enthusiastic presentation. Who has a question for Stacy or a remark or anything? Yes, Lisa. Hi, thanks for your presentation. So your point of that there, there are quite a few researchers potentially kind of researching similar things. I, 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 I'm, I was planning to mention that in my presentation too, so I don't need to do that. Um, but but I, I, that I think that's the case and it's probably gonna get more. But how to coordinate and who should coordinate? What are your thoughts on that? Projects? Right, to, to sort of ensure that you don't have this continual well, I mean, you, you call it research fatigue, which I guess corals could be research fatigued as, as well. well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think that we need to draw the conclusion that there needs to be, you know, no involvement of the Netherlands. Because also on the islands, especially when it comes to corals, let's, let's just stick to corals, they know that there's this bulk of knowledge and expertise at Wageningen University. So, of course, they would like to collaborate with that. But maybe that the questions that are formulated are more, you know, bottom up, so to say, or um, that projects are more derived from the curiosity that lives on the islands. And then you can kind of, you know, build on a project uh, jointly. And I think for the coordination of, of projects, it would be great if there's 
if it's possible to see if that could be on island because the, the research is taking place on island on island. But I think that some uh, because you're dealing with this small group again, um, people are also tend to be quite realistic in that they might want to do it, but they don't have the time to take on another project or be another coordinator. So um, my advice is just to kind of open and address that you know, as transparent as possible and see what the wishes are. And if they are willing for an external party to do the coordination, sure. And if not, then, you know, look for a different, uh, different approach. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Stacey. Um, my name is Vashti. Thank you for your presentation. It was very inspirational. <laughs> um, I am currently also a PhD student. And I was wondering um, uh, how... Are, because you said about the survey, surveys that people aren't really open to that. And um, how would you advise for someone to get hard data on certain aspects of patients, for example? Well, I don't think surveys can't work. For example, my colleague Walter, who's sitting over there, um, he's a political scientist and he did a really big survey on all six islands um, on the political regime and how people were ex experiencing that and... and long list of questions but what he did he was working with um, um, interviewers on island who were kind of conducting the surveys with with the individual so it's more labor intensive it, it costs a little bit more money it costs more time um, but I think that works better because you can kind of have some accountability with the people with the person that you're interviewing and helping them go through the questions um, I my experience was that that is that didn't really always work well in my survey because I noticed that people were very keen to elaborate every question. You know, I had a lot of close end questions. They're like, yes, but da -da 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 -da, and then all of a sudden three hours had passed. So and we were through ten questions. So I think be a bit realistic in amount of questions you ask at a time. Maybe you know split it up um, and do it more face to face. That could help. Last question or remarks for Stacy? Anybody? No? Okay. Okay. Masha Danki, thank you, Stacy. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, so, from Stacy, we go to Marielle, and Marielle is Marielle Ozinga. She has the blonde hair and the blue eyes, and she even speaks Fries, as I read on her LinkedIn. But her uh, research is firmly steered towards the uh, Caribbean part of the kingdom. And I think that's, that's something special. Um, um, no, she was obviously born here in uh, Holland. And she was a teacher on the elementary school in St. Martin. So uh, she will tell you more about that. She's an educational scientist. And I think her field of research is very interesting. It's a lot about families and family structures and how it works here in Dutch Caribbean families in comparison how it works at the islands, how are um, gays, how are maybe Dutch gays towards father absence is if you compare it on the islands, whether it's really such a big problem or not. All of these ex uh, aspects she has put in a presentation and the title of her uh, NWO uh, project, uh, her, um, her presentation today is Father Absence, the Cross-Cultural Experience and Possible Consequences. Marielle Ozinga. Thank you, Tanya, for the introduction. And welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Good morning for the islands. Also, thank you for uh, watching the live stream. I am uh, Marielle Ozinga, and I am currently in the second year of my five-year PhD project about father absence. And together with my colleagues from the University of Groningen and the University of Curaçao, I study cross-cultural experiences and possible consequences of growing up without a father among Curaçao, 
among Curaçao and Dutch and among native Dutch youth and their mothers. I was born in a quite small village in Friesland, as Tanya already said, with almost no cultural variety. But already quite soon, I became interested in international and cultural differences. And after my high school graduation, I worked for one year as an au pair in France. Also during my bachelor's in teacher education and pedagogical sciences, and my master in educational sciences, I went abroad to observe and teach primary school children in Belgium, Germany, and France. After my master's, I wanted to gain some more international experiences in primary school and to also be able to use the French language I learned in France. I started teaching at a primary school at St. Martin, sixth grade, actually. And what struck me was that more than half of the children in my classroom grew up without their fathers. When I asked my colleagues about it, I found out this was nothing special about my class, but it was very common on the island and also on other Caribbean islands. Getting to know my students and their mothers better, I started wondering what it actually means to grow up without a father in a culture where this is more common, like in the Caribbean, but also in cultures or societies where this is less common and where the nuclear family living together in one household is the norm, such as in the Netherlands. You wouldn't be surprised that I was very surprised that especially about or exactly about this subject, a PhD project of five years started. Up until today, Father absence has been researched in mainly Western societies, except for our Curaçaoan colleague, Odette van Brumme Girigori, who also has already some experience in this field. In these mainly Western societies, father absence is quite uncommon and has sometimes been portrayed as something harmful, problem-laden or undesirable. Negative effects of father absence that have been found up until today are, for instance, problem behaviors among father absent youth, more financial hardships growing up, lower educational outcomes, earlier age at menarche, risky sexual behavior, and poor adult mental health. What is lacking on this perspective, however, is a comparative perspective that also includes societies where growing up without a father is more normative, like in the Caribbean region. For instance, on Curaçao, but also on the other islands, father absence is widespread, and especially various other relatives or non-relatives share into the upbringing of the children. That is why it might be possible that father absence has other consequences or maybe no consequences and other experiences among Curaçaoan and other Caribbean youth and their mothers. To better understand what father absence means and to find out whether it really has consequences, we firstly invited Curaçaoan, Curaçaoan Dutch and native Dutch youth and their mothers to talk about their experiences with and perceptions of growing up without a father. The in-between group of Curaçaoan Dutch youth and their mothers is specifically interesting because they historically belong to a context or a culture where father absence is common, but nowadays they're living in the Netherlands, a culture where it is less common. I interviewed all native Dutch youth and their mothers, but to make sure the Curaçaoan Dutch youth and their mothers felt at ease during the interviews, I trained, or with my team, we trained several Curaçaoan Dutch interviewers here in the Netherlands, to make sure the interviews were also possible, for instance, in Papiamentu. Specifically, this group, however, the Curaçao and Dutch youth and the mothers, were very difficult to find and also to motivate to participate, maybe because of the sensitivity of the subject. What helped us in the end to find these participants was a more active approach of talking to people in person instead of, instead of a passive approach that I tried in the beginning, for instance, via email, via telephone, or via Facebook and other social media. In the end, we found almost all our participants by so-called gatekeepers. And with gatekeepers, I mean people prominent in, for instance, the, cult the 
Curaçao and Dutch Society, who found our research topic also interesting and important, and who motivated the people in their network to participate. One of these gatekeepers you might know, his name is Jan Dino, and one day I didn't know what to do anymore for the data collection to find these Curaçao and Dutch youth and their mothers. I decided to go to Martini Plaza, that's a, how do you say, a, a theater in Groningen, where he uh, was with his Caribbean combo show. I waited until the audience was gone, until his show was ended, and I asked him if I could ask him a question. I told him about my research project and about the difficulty I had finding Curaçao and Dutch youth and mothers who wanted to participate. Since he grew up without his father himself, he found the topic very important and via his sister who works in youth care, I found several participants who were willing to participate. Another great help into our data collection among this group was our Curaçaoan colleague Odette on Curaçao. Since she studied in the Netherlands and lived here for several years, she also had quite a nice network where we could find some social workers and other professionals who knew people who wanted to participate in our interviews. The active approach of really talking to people in person I talked about in the previous slides, I would also recommend to all researchers who aim or wish for a future cooperation with the Caribbean region. Before we started our data collections on Curaçao and in the Netherlands, a part of our research team visited Curaçao and our Curaçaoan colleague. By this visit, we got to know our colleague better, but also her research context. And together, we visited several local organizations, We trained her interviewers and we talked about the future of our project. I really feel this visit benefited our later communications and still benefits it. For the second part of our research projects, we made use of an online questionnaire who is identical on Curaçao and in the Netherlands. With this online survey, we try to test for possible consequences of father absence. Subjects that are asked in this questionnaire are, for instance, family relationships, school experiences, but also pubertal and sexual development, and possible alcohol use and drug use. Since these subjects are at least some of these subjects are quite sensitive, we were again very grateful with the help or help with our Curaçaoan colleague uh, Odette. Thanks to her cultural sensitivity and also her knowledge of Curaçao, almost all schools that we contacted were willing to participate. In the near future, we will be organizing a symposium about the results of our interviews with Curaçaoan, Curaçaoan Dutch and native Dutch youth about their experiences with and perceptions of father absence. For this symposium, we will invite all Curaçao and Dutch and native Dutch youth and their mothers, but also policymakers and other professionals, such as teachers, social workers, but also bachelor and master students. We will invite them to reflect on our results, but also, if possible, to use them in their daily practices. Of course, our Curaçao and colleague Odette will also be present, and she, she will present and she will present about her experiences on Curaçao. When the results of our quantitative uh, online questionnaire will be known, we will also organize uh, some seminars and workshops on Curaçao and on the other Caribbean islands. And thanks to these, de these results, we will finally know whether father absence indeed has consequences, positive or negative, and whether these differ per cultural context. I would like to invite you to come to me in the break or later this afternoon if you're interested in attending our symposium or maybe one of the seminars or workshops on the islands. Also, the people who are following the live stream, they are more than welcome on the islands. I thank you very much for your attention. Yes. I thought the, the Shandino... Uh, Trick was really, really clever, uh, Mariella. Yes. No, but it 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 also shows the importance of, uh, like, yeah, you also ask how 
how do you find people who want to cooperate, right? How do you approach them? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, very nice. As you can see, I don't have a Caribbean background as Stacy has, so for me, I think it was even more difficult to find them here in the Netherlands. Yeah, but you succeeded. Who has a question or a remark for Lisa? Yes, one, uh, Alex from Cyprian, and then I come to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your uh, wonderful uh, speech. Um, I was wondering, li while listening to your speech or your lecture, um, whether this research would be framed differently in the next call, uh, if it's uh, when it's bec when it becomes a, a project from a Caribbean, one of the Caribbean islands, whether uh, um, this is a problem which would be as urgent as you or your university or we in the Netherlands think it is. Uh, for one, and the other uh, is, would maybe in other terminology be used, like not father absence uh, families, but for example, more like female-headed households power, or, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, well, actually, to make it clear, um, we've in our research team, we don't see father absence as a problem. We just, well, it strikes us that um, only negative results are known up until now. But we think it also comes because mainly Western societies where father, father absence is uncommon are researched. So we have a very open view and um, we wouldn't be surprised if no consequences will be found among this group or maybe even positive consequences. And we also invited the mothers to participate to also hear their view. So about the, yes, what you're saying, uh, the female-headed households, we asked the mothers how it was for them to um, raise their children without the fathers. But I think it is very much possible that... Uh, this is the last project on... Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> absence fathers. Yeah. And our Curacao and colleague, she also did her PhD about father absence, but then uh, totally on Curacao but she named it uh, the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what it sounds like in, in Papiamentum, <laughs> father absent. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Hi, thank you for your um, very um, interesting um, lecture. I was wondering, how c um, will, will you guys also expand on the other islands? So for example, Aruba, Bonaire, because they're also, uh, I mean, speaking for myself, I mean, is is a very common thing, in, um, like you said, in the I other islands. So I was wondering, is Curacao representative for all the islands as well? Thank you for your question. We don't think uh, Curacao is representative for the other islands, but um, that's why we focused also on one, one island first. Also because uh, we could uh, have a cooperation with Curacao, with our colleague over there, because we think it is very important to have somebody uh, who's from the culture and who can also do the data collection over there. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, why the other islands aren't included right now. But I uh, experienced it myself also in the primary school, as I said, on St. Martin. So I agree with you that also on the other islands, um, it would be interesting to research it. Um, but we wouldn't do it, we, we didn't, yeah. Other so that's an invitation for... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm giving you the microphone. My name is George Rodriguez, I'm from Aruba. Um, is the, um, um, thank you for your presentation, it was a very nice presentation. Um, do you guys also um, measure the influence of the grandmothers um, in the part of the, um, when the fathers... Um, um, and they are now present in the family. Thank you, Josh, for your question. Very interesting what you're saying. And uh, one of the findings, or well, a little bit preliminary findings, because the symposium is uh, yet about to come, uh, is indeed that during the interviews, a lot of the youth uh, talked about other relatives, but also non-relatives who played a quite big uh, role in their education. So yes, we're taking, uh, we're including them and also in the online questionnaire. For instance, we asked all the youth with whom they grew up in their household, so to say. So uh, what I saw already uh, is that among the Curaçaoan youth, for instance, but also the Curaçaoan youth in the Netherlands, it happens a lot that, for instance, a grandmother or um, an aunt or other family members lived with them in their households and also played a big role. 
yes, so we're including it. Any other remarks? No. If not, you can easily find uh, Marielle during the break, which is coming now. Marielle, thank you so much. And um, well, let's try and join uh, Marielle the 6th of uh, September. Thank you. Um, we'll have a, a 30 minutes break and we'll wait for uh, Lisa. Lisa Becking is taking, t is taking us underwater at 3.30. So uh, please be back around at uh, 3.30 and have a drink. See you in half an hour.
is voor je meegenomen. Het lijn doen we niet meer. So, if everybody could take their seats. Yes. Okay. I realize there's a, there's a big need for Borrell, which will be in about 45 minutes. Okay. We're back. Um, Lisa is Lisa Becking. She's a tropical marine biologist, as you can see, and she's an assistant professor at Wageningen University. She's an expert when it comes to marine research, both in Indonesia, she travels the world, as in the Car Caribbean part of the kingdom. She writes columns for the Volkskrant, she does interviews for National Geographic, and she's a board member of the prestigious Jonge Academie, that's part of the Koninklijke Nederlandse Academie van Wetenschappen, de KNAW. And since April, Lisa is also a member of the academic board of the KNAW, KITLV. Um, Lisa will take us to the world underwater, and she has a very broad perspective, as we noticed when we, when we went to Wageningen last Monday to film her. She has a very broad perspective on how to combine different disciplines of science in NWO and outside of NWO calls. Um, so her call is also very much for collaboration and having the broad perspective. May we have your attention for Lisa Becking. Thank you, Tanya. Oh, thanks. All right, well, uh, good afternoon. Well, thanks for that um, introduction. And so I come, I'm an assistant professor at Wageningen, which means I have sort of the academic perspective, but I'm also a senior researcher at Wageningen Marine Research, where we do a bit more applied research, uh, where we do research um, in support of nature policy for the, the, the Dutch Ministry of LMF, or formerly uh, Economic Affairs, in conjunction with uh, local authorities and um, institutions. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was asked to give some reflections on, uh, well, actually natural, doing uh, research on natural science um, in, in the Dutch Caribbean and, and marine science. So I will give um, a totally non-comprehensive uh, review and purely subjective. <laughs> All right. So I have uh, had many ex um, adventures in the Dutch Caribbean, um, namely here also going down to the deep with my uh, scientific partner in crime, Erik Meesters, um, where here we, went, we uh, went down to 200 meters and uh, discovered 15 new species, actually some more, um, and, but also um, discovered some interesting uh, dynamics in the ecosystems, which has now uh, developed more into further research. We've also had a lot of adventures on the Seba Bank. Um, so this is uh, an area that we, we like to call the, the largest nature park in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and work here, again, expeditions have been since uh, 2011 and also um, organized and led mostly by, by or led by Erik. Um, and what's, what's great about these expeditions is actually that we've been going there for, for multiple years, getting an idea of the temporal and spatial um, dynamics of the biodiversity and the ecosystem functioning. But what I also just love about it is that it's a, a, a week in which Dutch, well, let's say European Netherlands scientists and Dutch Caribbean scientists come together as well as always a whole team of students um, to really kind of see each other's work and get to know each other and build the trust to, to, to move forward. But 
where what I'm going to be talking about a little bit more is sea turtles. So, um, so Joseph actually said that I shouldn't talk about science, but I, I just can't help myself. <laughs> so I'm going to give a little bit of data. Um, so this is a, a Dutch uh, project from the first call from the Dutch Caribbean uh, call uh, on the, the Dutch Caribbean sea turtle ecology and conservation. Now, formerly, uh, Per Polsbo uh, from, from Groningen, who I thought would be here, maybe not, um, and uh, uh, Marjolein Christiane from Wageningen, who unfortunately couldn't be here, and I are PIs, but we really, we wrote this project together with, with a whole team of, of collaborators from the islands, the different organizations that work with sea turtles. So we, we had a number of sort of scientific, ecological questions that were open and that were interesting to us. And then we talked with them to try to make, align it to make certain that it's also relevant for, for the islands. So what it kind of comes down to is that the, the Netherlands has adopted national and international legislation to protect sea turtles inhabiting the, uh, the, the Dutch Caribbean waters. The problem is that there's quite a lack of fundamental insights in the ecology, the migration routes, the population demographics, and habitat use of the green and hawksbill turtles. And, and this lack of, of knowledge also poses quite severe limitations to the implementing of effective management plans um, for the region. So as a result, we, we set up a, a, a quite an integrative uh, study with a lot of different methods, so using genomics, satellite tracking, isotope analysis, uh, and habitat mapping, trying to get to this sort of, um, at the end, trying to get all the science that, that's needed to, to, to create a science-based management plan. And uh, this project was set up in two uh, sub-projects, so with um, uh, sub-project one looking at habitat use and tracking, and sub-project two looking at population genetics. Um, now, what we first actually did was, there's a lot of information out there, but it was a little bit disparate. It was kind of all over the place. And so we tried to get all the information together on where are the nesting sites and where are the feeding sites what, and what are the risks. So a lot of that information was also available in, let's say, the Dutch Caribbean uh, biodiversity database. But there was also a lot of information on the islands that was just never actually like quantified or written down. So for example, there are beaches where, uh, where sea turtles come, um, but just there, there hasn't been the chance to really monitor these beaches, so we don't actually have numbers. So we put that kind of qualitative data in there as well. Then we also interviewed a lot of people and um, from our own observations also tried to sort of identify what are the risks, what are the threats, and what types of threats for each of these different types of habitats. So we're putting all of that together for all the six islands. Yes, I forgot to say this, this project is on all six islands. Um, and, 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 and ultimately we will be giving that to the, the Dutch Caribbean Biodiversity Database and also put it together in a sort of interactive map. Now, um, we are still getting everything together. This is sort of the final parts, and, and, and we'll, we'll have a final symposium in December. Um, but I wanted to show a little bit of information what we found about the migration routes. So sea turtles like to hang out in one area and eat and just live there. And then every so many years, they, they migrate, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of kilometers, to breed somewhere else. So the sea turtles that breed in Bonaire, we wanted to know where do they go after they breed. And you can find that out by tracking them. So here's a track, uh, a, a satellite tracker on their, on their back. And then uh, we throw them back in the sea. Uh, and here you see uh, our team, it's Mario Lein, uh, Mario Lein uh, Christiana, and Mabel Nava from SCCB, and Funchi from SCCB. And they put the turtle back, and then um, we can just, based on their tracks, find out where do they go. And the answer is everywhere. <laughs> um, so what that means, though, is so then basically what we find is that they, they really do um, go quite, they go, some go only go distances of 300, meter, 300 kilometers, and now there's up to, um, yeah, uh, thousands of kilometers. And 
what that means is that they cross the boundaries, the exclusive economic zone boundaries of many different countries, including countries that still have legal harvest of sea turtles or have a lot of bycatch of sea turtles in their fisheries, documented bycatch in their fisheries. Um, and so as, as a result, that kind of means that either actual harvesting or unintentional harvesting elsewhere in the, in the region will have effects on the populations that, that are in Bonaire. And seeing as they're also, sea turtles are kind of an, uh, part of the tourist experience of Bonaire, that's also something that's relevant for us. And possibly should be something that our Dutch government should be talking about in their interactions with these different countries. Now, when uh, we were also interested um, just to stay with Bonaire, Bonaire also has a huge um, foresting, uh, um, foraging aggregation, so an area where, where sea turtles feed, namely in Lac Bay. And we were interested to know where do they come from? So uh, where did they come from? And then when they, when they want to breed, where do they go? Now, what we can't actually track them to find that out because they stay a very long time in their foraging area. Um, but you can figure it out through indirect means, namely through population genetics. Because turtles like to nest in the same place where they, more or less, in the same region where they were born. And so that means that if you go to those areas where, these nesting areas, and you, you take some DNA, you can kind of get like a genetic signature for that breeding area. Um, and so that's sort of what we have here. We, ha we call them haplotypes, but they're kind of like genetic signatures for different rookeries, different areas where sea turtles breed across the Caribbean and the Eastern Atlantic. And you can just kind of look at the colors. So the colors kind of indicate, let, let's say, the, the, the symbol for, the, for those different breeding areas. So then we, we took samples from Bonaire, from Luck, um, and then analyzed their DNA and compared. What was really cool here is that because of our collaboration with SDCB, um, they, they already had a huge amount of data. They had been collecting samples from sea turtles actually since 2006. So we were actually really able to see how that aggregation of sea turtles was able to change over time. Um, and yeah, because otherwise with us, with our five-year program, we wouldn't have been able to see this kind of temporal data. What you see just very simply um, here is that from 2006 until 2016, you see a real shift in the, in, the, in, in, in the composition of this aggregation. And it's particularly a shift from, where, uh, from, from the Northwest uh, Atlantic, uh, Northwest, pardon me, uh, the Northwest um, Caribbean to the Eastern Atlantic. So doing a, a, some mixed model analysis, we find that, yeah, where the Eastern Atlantic populations used to contribute the most to, to uh, Lac Bay. So Eastern Atlantic, think of the Guiana, Suriname. That's kind of shifted now to um, where it's mostly the Northwestern Caribbean that get, contributes the most. So that's sort of the, 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 the Florida and Cuba and Mexico. What we also then found in our analysis is actually that this reflects the, the actually the conservation measures in these different regions. You see that the conservation success has been higher up in the northwestern area. The, the number of nests that are coming there are higher. And uh, in contrast, they're lower in, in, the, in the Guianas. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting thing. This kind of first time that we've been able to kind of link these two things together. And so this is a paper that Yuriam van der Schee, the, the PhD that's working in our group, is he's dealing with the reviews now and uh, hopefully publishing soon. So <laughs> um, all in all, just to give a few sort of, I guess, more conclusive remarks or recommendations based on our research, one thing that's clear, but I guess that was clear from the start, was there's really a, a need for a sea turtle recovery action plan. This is something that most, uh, most countries with sea turtles have this. The one that, that is clear, clearly present is actually from the Dutch Antilles and is from 1992. Some, some islands still had legal poaching at that time. So clearly a new uh, action plan is needed. Um, furthermore, also more standardized protocols across the islands. That is something that we've kind of seen um, and it's recognized, but something kind of needs to change there a little bit. Um, in, in conjunction with continuous monitoring. But all of this can only happen if there are, yeah, if there's enough staff. I mean, everyone wants to do it, but you need enough people to do it. So you need the dedicated staff. Oh, thank you. Um, 
So having dedicated staff towards sea turtles, you just see in the organizations that have that, they, they can just do a lot more. Um, because basically there's still a lot of baseline data that is uh, necessary to, to, to really understand how these animals move and also to understand how we can sort of interact well with them. All right, that brings me to this report. This was uh, it's the Staat van de Natuur van Caribisch Nederland, the Staat van Instandhouding. Uh, it was finished in 2017, but it wasn't allowed to be published till March this year. Um, and it, it basically analyzed, very simply put, it's a long report, very simply put, it analyzed the, the, the state of the nature in the Caribbean Netherlands. And in a very short uh, conclusion for the, 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 the coastal systems in the Dutch Caribbean, <coughs> pardon me, is that um, the, the state is not good. It is ongunstig. Um, and as a result, there's been a unanimous support by the by the, the our government, by the Tweede Kamer, to set up a coral uh, reddingsplan, a, um, a, a plan to save the corals. And so I'm hoping that also this will, also, so there's a lot of things happening as a result of that, but I'm also hoping that there'll be, yeah, there'll be a number of questions that are necessary to do that that will be possible through this uh, new Caribbean call. So I was also asked to give a little bit of my ideas on possible yeah, issues or thoughts or whatever about doing natural science um, in the Caribbean Netherlands or just some, some points to consider. Um, yeah, I'm just going to re 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 rephrase this uh, re um, in the sense that, yes, there's a lot is there, um, but there's still also just some things that are not understood about the ecosystem functioning. And I would say very much this whole interaction between land and sea. I mean, the, every, the, everything that kind of happens on land has effect on the corals and on the different ecosystems um, uh, along the coast. Um, I also feel, as, as Tanya said, that in, in you know, dealing with these major societal and, and scientific problems, we really do need the perspective of different disciplines and also both fundamental and applied science. And I, I again, I hope that the, the Caribbean call will, will take that into account. Um, and finally, with that, I hope also that the Caribbean call will be very clear in its objectives. As um, in the last call, um, I, I think I, I will speak for some natural scientists in that it, we probably shouldn't have applied in the sense that the, 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 the projects that came out were amazing and very necessary. I mean, they were related to education, health, um, uh, business, um, but they were all very anthropocentric and very applied. And I think there are a number of us that had done more natural science types and things, probably just wasn't a call that they should have applied for, which is fine. It's just, it's good to know beforehand, not so that you don't waste time. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would also like to say that um, one of the things I've noticed, um, and this is probably not only the case for natural sciences, but it's, it's the, the groups that I work with, there's very high transition of people in the organizations, and that, 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 that does make it sometimes difficult for the continuity of uh, data and protocols and knowledge. And that's not due to any lack of dedication by people. It's just that there, there, um, there has to be there has to be the resources for it. Um, so that is something that just I think that will make everything and uh, the, whole, the whole natural science stronger. Then to get back to a point um, that Stacy brought is that I, I don't see it too much yet for natural sciences, but I do, can, can imagine that in the future there may be overlap in projects and that you're seeing many, many more players and there are many more scientists coming in from the Netherlands. I think a lot more people are realizing that these are bijzondere uh, uh, gemeentes, uh, uh, municipalities in, in, in the Caribbean. And more people are coming, there are more NGOs, there are more consultancies there's from the government. And so the numbers are growing, and I'm just wondering how to deal with that. As in, um, it's great that many people are there, but how can we coordinate that when not everyone's looking at the same coral or are interviewing the same grandma on the corner? Um, so there's that, and then finally, I think also from the conservation perspective, I, I think there is also more clarity is needed of who's responsible for what. Um, so who's responsible for the monitoring, who's responsible for enforcement, and who's going to develop this long-term vision, because that is definitely needed.
but I also want to be positive. <laughs> Um, and that I, I feel that, so we've had lots of students in all of our different projects, and I'm certain all of the people who have the Caribbean call have been, uh, had lots of students. And so they're also key partners. And then we've also very much tried to have students from the Dutch Caribbean. There are a couple, at least one there. Um, and, and that's great because you often see students come back in, in, in their positions elsewhere. But I do sort of wonder, where all these amazing students we have from the Dutch Caribbean that are getting a very good education and, and going on, where do they go after graduation? Because not everyone can really go back. And that's, I don't have a solution and I don't know if there's a solution here. It's just more something I do think all of us should kind of consider and, and, and possibly in the formation of this grant that should be a point. Where do you go where, where it, to avoid the brain drain? Um, on that line, there's been some discussion about possibly a, a research station or an education hub on Bonaire. I mean, I think that's all very much in, 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 in higher thought process. But I do actually think that something along the lines of CNSI, which is on station, is doing a really good job. Something similar on Bonaire will, will be quite important too for, for doing the research, for education, for outreach. Um, and then finally, um, I... I um, when we were setting up this grant, when we were setting up the proposal for the Sea Turtle grants, I looked at all the websites of all the universities and I couldn't find a faculty of like, yeah, uh, natural sciences, conservation or something along that line. And so that was, it, like we would have loved to have had someone else from the, from the university on that, but it was just the, the most of the faculties are focused on, on law and medicine and business and tourism, which I totally get because you, you need to be functional. But I'm just thinking how, and particularly in line with, with these new developments, how, how to work with that. And so in any case, it's super to hear that, that uh, Aruba is starting, uh, starting sort of a new faculty, or in any case, PhD program towards uh, natural science. Um, but yeah, so that's something also I think uh, just something to put out there and to, to think about or how, how maybe universities can work together or work as a day And on that, if anyone has questions. Okay. Any questions? It may be about the sea turtles or about the, the brain... Drain and brain gain. Yes. Uga? Ja. ja. Goedemiddag. Mijn naam is Hilde Rodriguez. En ik had inderdaad een opmerking. Oh yes, sorry. I can do it in English. Uh, my name is Hilde Rodriguez and I had a question or a suggestion for the, for the organizing uh, committee. Um, I just uh, reviewed the website of LIFE, that's um, a program of the uh, European Union, and they gave like a framework for applications. And it helps a lot because then you don't make a re report of uh, 10 pages that nobody would, would read, and that saves a lot of time for, for the scientists uh, to apply, um, although it, it won't be succeeded. Framework, yeah. Okay. I see nods from Joseph and Niels. Not, yes. Anyone for Lisa? Maybe, oh, yeah? Yes, go ahead. Hi, thank you for a beautiful presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Josje Brouwer. I'm a research student, a uh, PhD student from the University of Amsterdam. Um, I had a question about the sea turtles in relation to the uh, tourism, because I cannot help but think that the tourism must have some impact on the sea turtles. Um, for example, when you go to Curaçao, uh, they usually... Uh, the fishermen, they feed the fish to the turtles, so there's a 100% chance for a tourist to see turtles there. And also in Bonaire, of course, you see many tourists uh, just uh, snorkel <laughs> behind the turtles. Did you focus on that as well, and what are your thoughts on that? So we, we were already doing quite a lot within the project, um, so we, we actually didn't focus on this sort of social interaction, uh, tourism interaction with the sea turtles. I mean... Uh, I mean, that's a whole field of study. I mean, because it's that weighing the, the benefit of tourism, which because the tourism brings money to do the conservation and also the awareness towards the tipping point where, where it goes over where the tourism are actually not positive actors. And, and so, I, yeah, I actually didn't know about Curaçao where, that they feed turtles to, for them to come. All right, that's a good point to, <laughs> to note. Thanks. Anyone? Questions, remarks, if not, Lisa will probably be here 
also during drinks. Yes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, I'm inviting uh, NWO team uh, for their um, final presentations. Um, Joseph Stuver. Good afternoon. Everybody uh, wants to uh, go to the drinks, but I will uh, briefly tell you some uh, more details about the plans which we are currently uh, making for the new phase of the Caribbean Research Program. It's uh, important to emphasize that this is all preliminary. No uh, definite uh, decisions have been taken, but I want to you, the, the, the interested people from uh, different uh, parts of academia and outside, we would like to inform you which uh, direction we are thinking uh, uh, at, or which direction the, the new program will, will, will go. I will start with a brief history of the Caribbean Research Program. It was initiated uh, in uh, 2012 by our Ministry of uh, Education, Culture and Science. In 2013, uh, the same ministry uh, decided to fund a five years funding program. And uh, we at NWO, we got the, 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 the we were asked by the ministry to implement uh, the, the funding uh, program. Total budget was uh, 10 million euros, and there was an additional uh, part, two and a half million uh, euros in these five years, which was uh, reserved for the CNSI on Synthesia. And this was uh, run by the NWO Institute, NEOS. In 2014, Nine large projects were funded from the first call of proposals. So this is not uh, only nine positions, but these, uh, these uh, projects are bigger than one uh, PhD or a postdoc position. In 2016, we had another uh, uh, round of, of funding. Again, um, uh, nine projects. In 2018, uh, because it was a very successful uh, uh, initiative. Uh, the ministry decided to continue the program for five more years with the same, uh, uh, the same total budget. In 2018, we also uh, established the NWO Program Committee for Caribbean Research. That's a new uh, uh, body. I will uh, explain this uh, in a minute. To to run the program, basically. And now in 2019, we uh, uh, prepare for the phase two, and actually, behind the scenes, we are quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, it's not ready, but uh, the preparations are advancing quite well. And so, as Wim told you, we will uh, hopefully uh, publish a call in autumn, and he, he said in September, where you will uh, be able to read all the, the details. And now we are in the stage of information and network events, and this is the first one, as, uh, and as uh, Tanya said, we will also have uh, information and network events on the islands, because uh, we find it important to explain the new situation and the new program also to the um, uh, regional, uh, local uh, people and institutions. So I will, uh, the new program uh, has this uh, uh, governance uh, structure, basically. The Ministry of uh, uh, Education, Culture and Science uh, funds the program. And NWO, which is an independent um, uh, uh, body under the ministry, 
um, uh, carries out the program. We have different uh, domains, as uh, Niels explained, and we have uh, established a program committee uh, which covers the science domain and the social sciences and humanities domain, uh, which uh, includes also two external NWO external experts. Nick Lopez uh, Cardoso, he is not here today. He is the, the chair of this uh, program committee. Wim is uh, one of the members. John Marks, also in the room, is uh, one of the members. And uh, Glenn today is also on this uh, body. And the program committee uh, is the, the uh, committee which uh, basically uh, runs the program. Formal decisions will be taken in the, in the board of the NVO Domain Science. So, before I, I tell you some uh, uh, more details... <laughs> oh, I will tell it again. You didn't get it? <laughs> So, just to, to explain um, why we came to the new uh, uh, program, how we came to the new program, I want to, I have done a, a very uh, not informal, very, very short uh, SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And so I will uh, talk you through those. I think the first phase of the Caribbean uh, uh, research program had a lot of strength. I just mentioned a few of them. It really created attention for Caribbean research topics. They were already present in, in, uh, in the community, of course, but uh, the, the call really uh, led to a kind of activation of the scientific field, and we got a lot more attention for these uh, subjects from very different uh, disciplines. So there are a broad range of topics and also a broad geographical range were covered in these uh, research projects. And it led to awareness building and also to really high quality projects. Some of them you have, uh, you have heard this afternoon. There were also some uh, weaknesses we realized uh, when uh, looking back. The first program led to a relatively weak regional embedding, and that was partly due to a lack of funding, because the institutions in the region could not apply directly for funding, so the embedding was also uh, uh, weaker than we, uh, we had hoped for. So the, the strength of the uh, broad range, at the same time, is also a weakness, because we get uh, mon many unrelated uh, projects, and the program as a whole is uh, slightly unfocused. And the program we had in the past, uh, uh, tends to, uh, to stimulate remote research, I, uh, I call it here, so that uh, uh, research is mainly carried out here and, uh, and will not necessarily lead to a true embedding in the, on the islands. So there, there is a suboptimal sustained impact. The opportunities we are seeing for the next phase I think we uh, should do everything to strengthen a sustainable basis for research in the region. And a sustainable basis uh, should apply to uh, capacity building and also to the development, upgrading of the infrastructure. And infrastructure can, uh, can uh, be everything what you need for, for doing science. An opportunity is to embed research really locally that's something we really want to stimulate, we want to, to achieve. 
We also want to encourage, and I think Niels has, uh, has uh, talked about that already, strong, even stronger research collaboration and research alliances within, but also between the Caribbean islands and the, the, the Netherlands. And if we succeed in this, this gives also the basis uh, for attracting additional funds for research. So not only from NWO, but also, for example, from European uh, uh, funding uh, schemes. So we hope that this will uh, initiate a, a kind of uh, snowball effect. What are the threats? So we, the first phase of the program was uh, good in the sense of activation of the field. But if we would continue with open calls, it would probably lead to an evaporation of funds without uh, lasting impact because it results in many small uh, uh, projects which lack the, the, the uh, strength and continuity to really change something. And uh, we would uh, rather support brain drain then invest in brain gain. And eventually, this might also lead to an increasing disparity between institutions in the Caribbean and the Netherlands. And the disparity can apply to, to different things like funding. And, so, and of course, from a, from a, a point of view of scientists, this would also be a missed opportunity to engage with uh, typical uh, Caribbean subjects. And that would be a, a shame if we wouldn't uh, have the opportunity, or we wouldn't take the opportunity to, to study those uh, in, in more detail. So I will now uh, just briefly present uh, a few elements of the new program. I uh, uh, reiterate its work in progress and uh, some uh, things might uh, might be uh, changed along the might change along the way. First of all, we did an inventory of ongoing research projects. A colleague of mine, René Prop, has done that, and we uh, because we realized that there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of projects going on, but nobody really knows uh, what's what the other one does or what what's going on. So there is no real overview of, uh, of projects. And that was also uh, something uh, we were asked by the ministry when they uh, uh, decided to prolong the, the program that we should look into that. So we, uh, we looked at all general universities, also universities of applied sciences, applied research institutions and other organizations. What are they doing on the islands or here with, uh, in terms of projects which, which are about the Caribbean islands of the kingdom. And we found uh, a few main uh, categories. We uh, classified uh, the projects. Uh, there were 185 uh, projects, and I'm sure we didn't find all of them. And they were mainly on education, cultural identity. That was one class of uh, subjects. Socioeconomic issues, governance, health and nutrition, and all related uh, aspects, and sustainability, environment, climate, water. Of course, you could, uh, you could expand this list, but that's uh, uh, how we uh, classified the ongoing uh, projects. And that also tells us uh, also something about the sort of priorities uh, in terms of uh, research projects. The priorities uh, uh, which uh, which which are currently given. The second element of the new program is uh, our intention to develop a kind of science agenda. It's a big uh, 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 word to call it a science agenda, but I couldn't find a, a much better uh, term for that. So we will. Uh, do an online public consultation. I have listened very carefully to Stacy and other uh, people uh, telling the, the, the 
difficulties about online consultations, but it will be a very, very simple one. We intend to, to ask only two questions. So I think uh, that should be, uh, should be doable. It's not yet operational, and we will send out the uh, uh, announcement uh, when it is uh, ready. And what we want to, to do is to give institutions and people on the island the opportunity to tell us what, they, what the, the, the most pressing issues for research are. And I have heard already in some of the presentations that uh, this would be something uh, interesting. And so I think, uh, I hope we get a lot of response. And uh, the, the whole process is a little bit modeled after the national research agenda. But we hope that we don't get the 12,000 uh, uh, replies in that case. And one other element of the new program is, uh, is an effort to take uh, research to a more international level. So we, could, uh, uh, we are planning to talk uh, to different uh, countries, institutions, uh, in the hope that we can collaborate on uh, Caribbean topics. So that could be done within the European Union, for example, with uh, France, UK, I'm not quite sure at this moment. But also with other relevant countries in the region, with other international bodies as well. But this uh, is not something we have, uh, 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 that's not the, the main priority. So we have not started uh, very, uh, very much with this uh, yet. The current focus is on uh, developing the new uh, funding program. And that is probably also the most interesting uh, part for you at this uh, moment. So the new uh, funding program will run formally from 2018 to 2022. That's the funding period. And I think the whole funding program will have the, the slogan, more focus, more substance. And we want to uh, strengthen the local research capacity. I've said it already, but it's uh, good to, to uh, <laughs> repeat that uh, a few times. And we want to emphasize the continuity of research in the region. So the preliminary structure of the new program is as uh, follows. Um, there will be, as Wim said already, there will be funding available for two research groups settled on the islands. So we um, will try to, um, uh, to fund broader research uh, groups, research programs, which are not only uh, acting from here, but which actually uh, 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 settle on the islands and have therefore the, the capacity to be embedded and linked in a much better way to the regional uh, context. The research groups should do uh, broad, broad interdisciplinary research within the framework of SITS. Most of you are probably uh, familiar with uh, SITS. It's small island development states. That's an that's a internationally recognized uh, uh, framework. It should, uh, the research should cover all six, the island, all six islands of the kingdom, and it can also go beyond that, depending on the, on the subject. The groups will be led by two uh, principal investigators who should also be mainly working on the islands. And these uh, uh, principal investigators, like uh, uh, Wim uh, told us in the beginning of this meeting, they will be uh, uh, selected by a, uh, a call. That's all we do here at NWO, it's always a call. <laughs> 
and uh, the call will probably be launched in, uh, in autumn uh, 2019. One thing which is uh, important uh, to, to tell is there will be a substantial budget for these two uh, research groups, a substantial budget for five years to ensure impact. So the exact uh, uh, budget has not been uh, decided yet, but you should uh, think of something like a Fiji or uh, slightly more as uh, Wim said this morning, or at the ERC uh, uh, grant. What do we want uh, them to do? So this scheme um, should stimulate embedding of research, of doing science, in the regional setting. And uh, we hope that in this way we can, uh, we can uh, make a contribution to building strong networks with regional universities and, and other relevant organizations in the, in the area. And uh, in addition, we hope that this will also, uh, these groups will also make a contribution to, um, uh, to higher education in the region. And if uh, this, uh, if we succeed, I think we do, we will, if we succeed in this, if we get uh, uh, good groups, good uh, leaders, they will probably also be, uh, have to be some uh, pioneers in their area. If we uh, succeed, then I think uh, these groups will also have the, the opportunity and also have the, the, the capacity to participate in national and international research, consor research consortia. And so they can also uh, help attracting more funding through different, uh, different uh, uh, schemes like NWO, Horizon 2020, and the follow-up of Horizon 2020, which is now under development which will be called uh, Horizon Europe. But to achieve this, we will, of course, we cannot do this ourselves. We will just uh, 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 provide funds and the, 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 the structure, but we need you, the scientists, but also the organizations here and in the Caribbean region to make this a success. Thank you. Okay. Anyone who wants to help Joseph? No. Anyone who has a question or, yeah, Tatiana? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, what are the criteria for the principal investigators? Are they supposed to be from the islands themselves, or are they? Uh, is there? It could be Dutch people, because maybe you don't find the principal investigators that you need for a certain project on the island. Yeah, we we uh, received already uh, quite a few warnings that uh, these uh, principal investigators we are looking for are not uh, uh, available. But I'm still uh, being optimistic. So the, the, we don't know yet what the, what the exact uh, requirements will be, because it has not been uh, decided yet. But I think it will be as open as, uh, as possible. Does that mean also that, um, sorry, does that also mean that um, these uh, principal investigators are, can be st like PhD students or, or uh, basically, or let's say, no, um, they not will not be. Uh, they will, that's, uh, that's uh, almost uh, certainly not uh, the case because uh, the requirements will be that they build and lead a, a strong group. We don't, uh, all, we don't aim at, uh, at uh, very um, uh, established uh, professors but we are probably aiming at the intermediate uh, 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 career level where people are open to, um, uh, to uh, develop new things. 
but they must have a certain, uh, a certain experience in the field. So PhD students will, not be, uh, will most likely not be uh, uh, allowed to, to apply for this. Okay, then, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, and then how are you going to avoid that certain research uh, projects um, will uh, kind of have, like, how do you get a more leveling uh, playing field in that yeah. sense? Because some, some researchers are just maybe not available. Some researchers yeah. are not. Yeah, her, her question is basically, so how do you get a, a, a lev, uh, um, an honest level, level playing field? Because she's a PH, no. Yeah, so the, the question is how to involve PhD students or, or ca Caribbean scientists. No. Sorry, so I meant more in the sense that if there's a research uh, institute in the Netherlands wants to cooperate uh, on a research project with uh, people in the islands, but there are just not no principal investigators available, then they might be excluded because they just can't find these people. How do you avoid this from happening? Well, I think uh, we have to distinguish between the, the, the generic measures and uh, the specific measures, because uh, I, I have the feeling that you're more talking about the generic measures, because uh, uh, everybody, with the change in the N NWO granting rules, Everybody has the, the, the possibility, everybody employed by a public, uh, publicly funded university in, in the Caribbean has the possibility to apply for funding. And so this will serve the broad uh, 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 field. But the two groups, they will uh, focus on certain subtopics, uh, they will not, it's impossible that they cover all the, the, the fields. So it will also be uh, up to the, to the uh, PIs, to the prin principal investigators, to define their subjects and to make clear to, the, to, to us or to the, to the expert committee which will, which will uh, which will make uh, recommendations on this. So they have to make clear how they uh, interact with uh, local um, universities, uh, stakeholders, uh, organizations. Mr. Marx, yes. Oh, many questions, yes. Yeah, I'm John Marx. I'm an independent member of the program committee, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the program committee. It's important to emphasize that. Um, just one question and a comment. A question to Joseph. Uh, may, uh, could you expand a little bit more on the relationship with the Caribbean Netherlands Science Institute that you foresee in the program? And my comment is that uh, in, the, in, in the way we have been thinking about the program, the setting up of the program, we really want to have an impact at the end of this, uh, this period, an impact, a permanent impact in research and researchers in the region. And that's why we have chosen not to, to distribute the money in smaller projects, but to have a big, a big project. Now, when you think about people who can lead such a project, you need actually uh, sheep with many more than five feet because what you really want is people who are able to build something, to build outreach, to build teams uh, crossing many disciplines, including the natural sciences and the social sciences, and in my view, including also the, the, the humanities and the technical science. So you ask a lot of people, and that means that the proposals that you will get will probably be quite complex and large and will require a bit of further design and we need to think about how to do that uh, through a, a call process. So uh, it's really, uh, it's, it's not simply trying to get some good projects, but it's to, to get a new type of institution f off the ground. Okay. Yes. That was the, the remark. Yeah, do you want to? Thank yeah? you very much, uh, John, for, for clarifying uh, the, 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 the intentions uh, further. And uh, your question related to the, to the CNSI, the Caribbean Netherlands Science Institute on Stasia. And uh, I haven't uh, 
uh, talked about that because uh, that's uh, currently uh, under uh, discussion. And we also got a, a, um, a question from the ministry to think about the position of the CNSI in the new program. And, uh, uh, well, we are not actually in a, in a, in a uh, stage where I, can, uh, where I can offer many details, but I think the CNSI will get uh, a much more prominent uh, position, much more uh, important position. That's, a, in, that's uh, what, uh, what we think of and what, what I hope of in the new program. But how this uh, exactly, uh, uh, how this will work uh, in, in detail, I really don't know yet. There was a question here. Yes. Rosemarin Hufte, KITLV. I have a question that extends on capacity building. And that is, uh, Wim, I think, mentioned it, that you are going to invite people to be part of a VENI committee so that they can judge applications or somebody else. I'm sorry. I think Wim does everything. Um, but that they can be part of the committee to judge applications so that they can get a taste of how it works. But that is only going to be uh, late next year, early, uh, or late this year, early next year. How are you, I mean, writing a proposal, we all know, is complicated. Uh, not only the budgetary, but also the content, how to do this. How are you going to provide kind of a service to the people in the Caribbean who might not be used to this Dutch system? Yes, that's a very good question, I think, and we have uh, thought about it uh, a little bit, but I don't have a very definite answer to it. But this is actually uh, one of the questions we really want to discuss with the institutions, uh, University of Curaçao, University of Aruba, when we uh, go there in, um, in autumn, because uh, as uh, Niels explained uh, earlier this afternoon, um, it's also for Dutch institutions, it's not, uh, it's not trivial. And so if you're not used to this system, it takes quite uh, something to, uh, to get into it. And I think uh, the, uh, over time, uh, institutions in the, on the islands, they also, uh, there is a need to, uh, um, in a way, professionalize the, the, the uh, funding part. Of course, now, up to now, they were not uh, allowed to submit uh, a proposal, so uh, they, they did, <laughs> there was no need to have that. But I think, uh, like uh, Dutch universities, they all have uh, uh, granting um, uh, offices. And so that might be a, a possibility for the institutions uh, to, to uh, deal with it. So some specialists uh, helping the, the, the researchers in, in uh, drafting their, their um, applications. But it will not be a sudden change. Lisa Becking, yes. Well, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that there, there potentially are developments with CNSI giving it another status, because something I just, just noticed while, um, while we heard the first presentation, when it showed the universities and the institutions that can apply, they're all universities not on the best island. So actually, you have, so you have these three islands, Seba, Sinta Stations, and Bonaire, that actually can't be, there are no one from PEIs from those islands. I, I don't really know any answers, it was just I was noticing that, and I was thinking, gosh, that's, that's potentially, uh, talking about the level playing field, that potentially could have that's, effect. That's, yeah. And also in relation to fostering research nuclei and, and, and indeed building up institutions, that's wonderful, but, but what are your thoughts about those three islands? Yeah. The best, the best island. yeah. Yes, what, yeah. that is, uh, it's just uh, a fact that there are no, um, no universities, no academic institutions which would qualify as, uh, as uh, institutions we can, we can fund. So there is not uh, at this moment not much we can do on our side. But uh, uh, something which I said earlier already is that uh, um, 
institutions on uh, these islands, they can of course collaborate with the universities, and I think that will be uh, one of the one of the uh, ways forward. You suggested an educational hub or something on Bonaire. Yes, but I, I don't think that would have that. Well, at least not in short term. That wouldn't have that status. No, but no. I'm just, I'm just because I mean then, but but then this, then it's not different than it is now. I mean, we also incorporate all the different institutions. I mean, they're part of the project as well, but they can't. They just can't leave. But I, what I mean is actually that uh, the different institutions on, on on the islands and also on the other three islands. Uh, this applies to all the six islands, that they could have part-time um, uh, professors uh, at the universities, and by this. They, these people, they do qualify uh, for us as uh, as applicants, and I think that's also what you see here. That is not the again not a short term thing uh, to do, but this has uh, a lot of potential. I think also for the for the three islands, without a uh, a um, uh, publicly fu uh, funded university. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Adriana Tami from the University of Groningen. Um, I'm the PI of one of the proposed uh, projects that were granted in the last call. And so I'm trying to, to understand it or to see if I understand. So the next call will be two groups, which means two big projects that will be granted only. And the idea is to have sort of a big consortia, multidisciplinary, and there will be two PIs per group. One, okay, so these two PIs are the PIs of each project, or big project. Yes. Okay, and you, what you just said is that you want these uh, projects to be multidisciplinary and you will be still defining which are the fields of the scientific that, that will be eligible. And so that, I'm, that's why I would just to clarify because uh, the ones who are already, like us, working in the islands, if we will have a chance to join, obviously this will be, then we will join into a bigger consortium and maybe bringing continuity to the projects that we already have. Is that one of the ideas? Just to understand yes. what is the I, frame of thought. The, the, the exact uh, topics uh, or the, the, the areas, I cannot, uh, I cannot say anything uh, concrete about that uh, right now, but it is in, in terms of uh, strategy, it is the intention that, uh, that the PIs, the research programs, the groups, uh, which we will um, uh, fund, that they combine or they, they uh, join forces with uh, consortia, with uh, PIs already uh, uh, working on subjects on the islands, so that uh, that would be great, and we also we will also encourage them to take up this uh, positive energy from the different consortia. One more yeah, yeah, exactly. So in that respect, I was going to ask if you will have any more networking uh, meetings, or how can and will facilitate networking not only with the ones who are already working, but. Other, for instance, uh, we're working uh, only for in Curaçao. Our intention is to broaden to all the other islands. Mm -hmm. That was already our intention. That it's good to see that this is also your intention. Mm -hmm. How can we find with whom to work in this other? That's a good uh, question, and I think it's it's uh, it's valid uh, to say that uh, there is some need for more uh, networking events. We have not. Uh, uh, except for the information events, uh, we have not uh, uh, made any plans, but we are very interested and very open to, suggestion, to suggestions uh, of, of how to do that. So please uh, contact us and, and uh, tell us what you need. Well, yeah, we should organize. Let's do three more questions because it, it really is 5.30. And we should go for drinks. Yes, well, well, okay. Yeah, I go to the lady, I go to Eric, and I go to... This young man, yes. All right, so th uh, thank you again for your um, um, presentation. And that was exactly my question. So how are you going to work on the networking? But maybe w you asked for a suggestion, maybe for, for a next uh, networking meeting, maybe uh, put on the tags, for example, like a color, and then put like 
for example, red would be health. And then I would know, oh, health, I can go to her and I can talk to them and uh, see how we can try to form a collaboration because, uh, for example, right now I'm in health, so anyone in health, please, please contact me. <laughs> so, yeah, because, um, I mean, I, I'm a PhD student. I come from Aruba, so for me it's a very... Uh, I, w I would really like to get to know more what, what I can do and uh, how I can bring something back. So the brain gain, what we already talked about. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the suggestion. And so um, we have some, some experience with organizing, um, um, we call them mainly matchmaking uh, 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 events. So bringing people uh, together, uh, which do not uh, uh, necessarily uh, work together already. So, but all suggestions of this kind are very welcome. Erik Meesters. Hi, it's Joseph. Um, yeah, I've been listening the whole afternoon now, and there's just a few things that I think about and that, that, that I'm wondering about. Um, it's very nice of MVO to think of, you know, five years. But, of course, I mean, five years is, is gone in a click, and it doesn't mean much for these islands, I think if you not think beyond the five years. I mean, the, the, if you don't want a brain drain, which is happening the whole time, you need to have jobs there. Yeah. And, and the islands are very dependent on, on tourism. Um, well, they don't have much natural uh, resources. So, and the only universities that are there are basically law, medicine, and uh, eco economics. So do the islands need more econom economists, more lawyers, and more doctors? Uh, I'm not sure. So I, I think um, sh we, s we should think much more long term. And how do these islands get jobs for the people? So which if there, are, if there is a, a, working, um, a market for jobs, then people will go to the islands. But if there's not, then you can, you can educate as many people as you want, but they will all leave. Yes. Yes, but it is, it is true. Yeah, but maybe that also the, the survey will help to bring the yes. local needs. And, and what we are trying here, of course, we are, uh, we are NWO and uh, from the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Education, Culture and uh, Research. So we try to make a contribution to that by using uh, research and science. Of course, we will not be able to, to solve all these uh, complex issues. But by studying uh, SITS-related uh, problems, we may uh, make a small contribution to the future of the island. So, but it's, you're, you're of course right. Closing remarks. Yeah, also to say something positive actually is we, we do get more and more students from there and, and, and some of them really go back and get a job there. So there's, there's, I think there is a, a long-term impact, but it's going really slowly. Much slower than I would like to, seeing how nature is kind of uh, slowly disappearing as well. Yeah, because maybe that's good to say you work with Lisa on s several projects, yes. Yeah, so for nature, you can reach Eric. Okay, last question or remark yes. from a young student, good. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm very happy to hear the NWO is, uh, you know, uh, providing this program for the Caribbean. Um, I'm a student at the University of Groningen. I'll be finishing next year and I really want to do a PG, but just to have some uh, orientation, this program that will uh, um, open in September to apply, it's only for uh, people that already have a PG, right? Or is there also a flexibility for students who would like to join this program as part of their PG or something in direction? Because I would course, like to do that. Of course, there will be uh, such opportunities. The PIs, the leaders, they will be, uh, we hope, uh, mid-career uh, scientists, but they have to find people working with them. And that is one of the major, major uh, tasks for them because they cannot do all these uh, things themselves, but uh, they should find the right people, young people mainly, I think, to, 
to do the research and to do all the 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 other um, things which we would like them to do. So definitely, yes, uh, watch yeah. out for those uh, yeah, I'm, programs. I'm glad to hear that because I know more students my age from Aruba that would like to do a PGN research, so I will definitely reach out to them. And I'm going in the summer, and I will obviously do my best to see if I can network some more students. So that was the main question, but I'm glad to hear that even students that who want to do a PG could be involved in the program. Because yes, then, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the the the, uh, the PI will build a project, and part of the funding, if I understand correctly, will go to this PI. But then there will be PhD positions, postdoc positions in his or her group, and and that person will will start looking for the best people to work with. So there there will be opportunities. Yes. Yes, exactly. So it should result in a in a group. Two more, Joseph. Don't go. So, uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, wonderful meeting. My name is Robert Borst from Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Um, and, and now that I do have the microphone, I'm wondering which question to share, actually. Um, because I have plenty. I've got plenty. So, first of all, I, I really like Lisa's question about the Bonaire, Stasia, and Saba region. And then I'm not so sure about the solution, the solution to collaborate with, for instance, University on Curaçao. That would be like saying, let's collaborate with the university in Germany because they do understand Dutch problems. And I don't think that's the same. And I've been in quite a few of FP7 consortia, and there you consistently see the conclusion, no, but our country is different. So yes, I do, I mean, I, I would encourage collaboration, but be, be sure that you don't generalize and say these islands are all the same because I don't think they are. And, and that's probably not what you're saying, but just be careful there, I think. Um, we know quite a bit about those different um, dynamics, actually. The second being, um, I do like the, the idea with the stickers, but if you do want this interdisciplinarity, you probably need to mingle. Um, so then it's not necessarily the best thing to emphasize that that is uh, natural sciences and that is health. I would really mix them uh, and think about a way to do that in a productive way. Thank you. Yes, usually uh, if, if we do such meetings, uh, we may uh, uh, <coughs> hand out uh, colored uh, stickers. But then we uh, force people uh, with different colors to sit at the same table mm -hmm. and to discuss uh, things. Yeah. That helps usually. Okay, yes. I'm Sophia Saavedra from KU Leuven, but I lived and worked 10 years at the University of Curaçao. Uh, regarding his question on job creation, mm -hmm. Uh, in the collaboration of Kai Leuven with Aruba, it's actually included yeah, yeah, that the PhD students, they get after, offered afterwards a position at university to become professor. It's like part of the game, and maybe that's something you could think of. Because it's actually really necessary to have capable people teaching at the university.